so before we start, I just want to get a general view of like how familiar people are with sort of the topic at hand. So how many of you have taken at least one semester lab? Cool. Uh, how many of you know who Cicero and Tiro are? Amazing. Okay. How many of you have read Cicero's Letters to Friends or the Epistula of Familiaris? Okay. So by now you should have a copy of the handout. Uh, the selections aren't chronological, but they're in the order of my argument. Still, so I put the important parts of the Latin in brackets next to the English translations. So if anything becomes unclear, please uh, ask me during the question period. Uh, we have a collection of Cicero's letters to his friends, family, and associates titled, unsurprisingly, his letters to friends. It's divided into 16 books, and the 16th and last book of letters begin with seven uh, that I'll be fo focusing on today. These seven letters are fascinating because we can situate them in a clear context in ancient history. Cicero and Tiro were traveling from Athens to Rome in the winter of 50 BCE, only a few months before Caesar crosses the Rubicon and starts the Civil War. Tiro gets sick, and he stays at the Greek town of Patrae for seven months. As Cicero stops from town to town, from Lucas to Eleusia, he sends these letters to Tiro over the course of a single week. Sure, these observations are important, but I want, to challenge, uh, I want to challenge why these letters are historically significant to our understanding of Cicero and Tiro. McDermott serves as a clear example when he writes, Tiro's illness, brought on, no doubt, by his overzealous work for his patron, apparently yielded to treatment. By the time Caesar crosses the Rubicon, Tiro is fully identified with all of Cicero's personal and political interests. But how can this be? Even in this simple explanation, we haven't linked Tiro's absence to his health, but we've linked both his absence and his health to that slippery concept of love. Uh, but we never have Tiro's voice in these letters. It's always just Cicero. In fact, Cicero himself invites us to leave emotions out of his Latin. Uh, let me look at, let's look at the first selection here. I can't and I don't want to write you what feeling I'm affected by. It is Cicero himself who is brought to a certain state of mind by the influence of, an effect assumed, an emotion. He claims he cannot write about this, although he writes exactly what he feels afterwards. He rephrases this in the second selection here, I was differently affected by your letter. I was seriously <laughs> shaken by the previous page and a little relieved by other. Here are the other two overarching themes of Cicero's language, comparison and qualification. The differently variate introduces two conflicting emotions. He is thrown into disorder, shook, perturbatus, and he's restored to a good condition, recreatus. At the same time, Cicero qualifies the turbatus with the intensifying preposition per and the adverb valde, just as it qualifies the recreatus with the weakening and verbal accusative power. So we're going to set aside ourselves from our assumptions about Roman friendships, Roman patron-client relationships, and our assumptions about Cicero and Tiro. Instead of reading these into his Latin, we're going to read out of his Latin by breaking down the basic building blocks of his letters, the word choice, the syntax, and the characterization. So let's begin with word choice. Selection number three is the first few lines of the 16th book. I thought I could suffer this longing for you more easily, but obviously I don't. And even though it's really important to our triumph, that I come to Rome as soon as possible, I still seem to myself to have sinned because I had left your son. Cicero describes his wanting to see Tiro in negative and overly emotional terms. In other letters, he'll pair this longing, desiderio, with his great worry, the magnus lequitudo, or his greatest desire, the maxima voluntas. On the other hand, how does he describe Tiro's actions? But since your will seemed to be that you didn't want to sail unless your body was fully strengthened, Tiro's wanting to stay behind has become his will, voluntas, and later in the same letter, Cicero will describe it as a decision, concilium, or judgment, sententium. These are all impartial, legalistic terms in Latin. So now Cicero has put blameworthiness next to blamelessness, emotion next to reason, and himself next to Tiro. These personal justifications bleed into the impersonal or conventional, just as the description of our triumph, the nostrum here, uh, is sandwiched between such a clear delineation between the emotional man, like ego, and the rational you, or two. We can also start to separate the emotional and rational from the words that Cicero chooses to mean to get better. The four verbs that come up most often are convalesco, as in selection number four, 
thermo, and by extension, the con thermo with the intensifying proposition con as at the end of selection number three, and waleo in selection number five. So convalescendo is, uh, convalesco is the least ambiguous, so it's used the least. It's only used as a gerund that shows the purpose of Tiro's delay. Waleo is much more interesting since it pulls double duty as the formulaic goodbye or farewell at the end of letters, like our sincere bit. At the same time, we can parse it as a direct command or imperative, farewell. Cicero repeats it too often and too emphatically for it to be simply generic, as in selection number five, Farewell, my dear Tiro. Farewell and hello. Lepta and everyone else send their regards. Farewell. Note the threefold repetition of Wally in between words that also have ambiguous meanings in Latin, with good health, salve and salutum. To a similar effect, the again and again, etiam et etiam, in selection number six, is used at the unending of multiple letters to the same effect. Again and again, Tiro, my dear, farewell. So finally, we return to firmo and the intensified confirm. To make firm or fast refers both to the physical health and the mental qualities of resolution, courage, fidelity, and credibility. This ambiguity forms the dilemma that the transgressive passive Tiro precisely doesn't put in front of, uh, sorry, the passive Cicero precisely doesn't put in front of Tiro. Should he work towards recovering his physical health or work towards recovering the health of his relationship to Cicero? So now that we have these building blocks of emotional vocabulary, we can see how Cicero connects them together through syntax. Cicero wants Tiro to carefully, diligente, most carefully, diligentissime, attend to the careful work, diligentia, of his own health. Just as, just as he wants Tiro to care, diligent, for Cicero. But Tiro can't care equally to both of these things at the same time. So Cicero builds a scale through syntax where Tiro must weigh the two cares against each other. The first step is to qualify or compare the quantity of love. Who is loving whom? So let's take a look at selection number seven. Thus you will consider, my dear Tiro, that there is no one who loves me unless he loves you in the same way. Cicero repeats the sentiment again and again in different letters. No one loves me who does not care for you as much as you love me, or as much as you know that you are loved by me, do so and so. This almost immediately shifts into a correlative, a correlative or conditional sentence that compares Tiro's love to Tiro's health, as in the last line of selection number seven. As much as you devote care for your good health, I will judge that you value me that much. And in selection number eight, as much as you care for me, apply yourself that much to your care to yourself. Note the mood of the main verb, attend to, adhibe, in the, in the apodosis of number seven. It's a direct command in the imperative, just as when he writes, if you love us all, and especially me, your teacher, then strengthen yourself, confirm it. Or, you will make sure, if you love me, that the slave of Costas is in the port every day to, the, to deliver me your letters. These commands mirror the barrage, uh, the barrage of Wale at the end of each letter, as well as the commands back in Selection number seven. Set aside all things, be a slave to your body. Omnia depode and corpore sum. So welcome to this first of a series of not as funny, cruel, almost cruel jokes that Cicero makes to the ex-slave Tiro. Cicero makes the same joke with the verb libero, or I will I liberate. Uh, I am with a great worry about your ill health. If you liberate me from this care, I will liberate you from all other things. Cicero has maneuvered Tiro's ill health and recovery within the zone of slave-like behavior, and thus, uh, in, a literal, uh, in a literary sense, renders it a non-choice to Tiro as a free person. But suppose that Tiro rejects this categorization. Then Cicero juxtaposes Tiro's health to his duties as a freeman, as a client, and as his assistant, as in selection number eight. Add the care for your health to your countless duties to me, and this will be the most gratifying of all. He immediately has us doubt the sense of the countlessness, the innumerabilia, because he immediately counts them out in selection number nine, on the other side of the handout. Countless are your duties to me, household, public, Roman, provincial, in private cases, in public ones, in studies, in my letters. 
All these things you will have beaten if, as I hope, I will see you healthy. The superlative, the superlative description of his duty as the most thankful, gratissimo, is contrasted with how Tiro no longer assists in any of his normal duties through his absence. As a result, if Tiro takes Cicero at face value and looks after his own health, he both contradicts his status as a free person and hurts Cicero within the correlational, conditional scale of health weighed against friendship. The last weight factor is the presence of the people around Cicero and Tiro, who I've chosen to describe as binary characters. These are the doctor Asclava, the host Luso, the host Curious, and the quaestor Miscinius. We can really get a sense of how Cicero feels about Asclava and Luso in selection number 10. About your doctor Asclava, you both write that you consider him fine, and I hear thus although I do not approve of that man's treatments. Your host, Luso, I fear that he is more careless than curious, first of all because all Greeks are, then because although he had received letters from me, he had sent none back. The shared Greek nationality of Tiro and Luso is juxtaposed next to their behavior. Both Tiro and Luso have been negligent in replying when Cicero wants them to reply or replying, perhaps, in the way that Cicero wants him to reply. At the same time, in this selection, Cicero has invited us to an entirely different layer of subtext. Tiro seems to have liberated himself from Cicero through Luso, whose name should remind us in Greek of the verb luo, and free, even when he should have been taking care of himself with curious, compared with the Latin cura. At the same time, broth ius has been given to Tiro, even though he has an upset stomach in Greece, the kakostomakos here, while his law or duty, the use, again, has made him wrongly upset as a servant in Rome, when we compare kakostomakos to kakos or stomachos, or the Latin. But in the end, Tiro seems to prefer Espapo and Luso to Curious and Miscanius. Cicero has heard as much selection number 10, and he sarcastically writes this when he says, but him you praise, so you will judge what should be done. Consider the, the emphatic and needless repetition of the subject to, already implied in the verbs laudas and judicamus. Furthermore, we know from later letters that the doctor Spago treats Tiro for several more months. Cicero sounds like he's almost given up on, uh, given up on, uh, the Dr. Scapo, uh, in the contrafactual construction in selection number 11. I would have wanted you to avoid Luso's dinner party so that you wouldn't have suffered a seven-day fever for the fourth time. But since you prefer to submit to your propriety over your health, take care of the rest. Not only do we see the characteristics of Cicero's emotions again, the use of slave-like language such as submit, the obsequy here, the generalizing imperative of reliqua cura. But Cicero has rephrased this behavior as if it was Cicero's, uh, as if it was Tiro's propriety, puro, in the same emotional zone as the discretion and self-control of prudentia and temperantia in selection number four, because there is something impudicus in the implication that Tiro has disobeyed Cicero, or that Cicero has to point this out. <coughs> The final piece of the puzzle, then, is the slave Mario, who is ever-present in the background of these letters. Cicero has sent Mario with the first of these letters so that he might either come back to me with you as soon as possible, or, if you delay, that he might return to me at once. Mario returns over the course of the first three days and returns with one of Cicero's letters, to which Cicero writes three in the same day, and. In these three, we can see the height of the sass in selection number 12. I wanted to send Mario back to you, since if you're just even a little bit better, you would send him to me. But I noticed that Mario could only bring back one letter, even though I was waiting for several. Note again the weakening, diminutive force of Melius Scully. So when all three of these effective layers of virtuous <coughs> syntax and characterization are taken together, 
we can understand that Tiro's absence from Cicero has become strained and unusual in the same way that Cicero's description of it is also strained and unusual. The structure between patron and client, or master and slave, or teacher and student that Cicero would prefer to keep implicit is at stake. I hope I've shown you how ambiguous Latin expressions of love frame ambiguous relationships in a manner that deserves as much attention as the questions of ancient history of who or when or where. <laughs>